Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode three of Celebrity Skin Talk. And today we have Dr. Leah Tutin on. And if you may not know, you would have seen her from The Apprentice. And we're talking all about The Apprentice and her amazing clinics. So I hope everyone is doing good. Hello, hello. Uh, I'm just going to wait for her to join. Look gorgeous. Oh, thank you. It's been a long day. I'm not going to lie. And yes, there you are in the room. Do, 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 do. Um, um, just wait for her to request. Hey everybody. Hello. Uh, ah, hello. Hello. How are you? Are you okay? Hello. I am good. I am good. It's been a hectic dash home, <laughs> but I am now home. Oh look, I know. You know, I was like, I hope you're okay because I completely understand when you just like rush in and it's been a busy day for you. So. Yes, clinics are very, very busy. February is a big month for thread lifts. So yeah, really hectic day today, but amazing and yeah. very fun. Yes, yeah, good. I'm glad. Thank you for coming on. I'm so excited to chat to Thanks. you because the things that we love, just like, you know, everything about skin and clinics and all of that. So I can't wait to talk about it. All of that. But before we get into it, my lovely, I, I read about this and I can't believe it was like 10 years ago that yeah. you were on The Apprentice. That's like a decade ago. I know. It's so crazy. It feels like it was so long ago, but also like it was yesterday. It's, yeah, I can't believe it's been a decade. But yeah, it's actually since we filmed it, you film it about six, six to nine months before it airs. So it's probably nearly 11 years since I filmed it. Um, so yeah, it just feels like it's flown by, but also feels like so long ago in terms of my own journey, professional journey. So yeah, yeah it, it's man, like I, I, I can't believe how long it is because I remember watching that series and it was just amazing. And I was just like, ah, oh, but so long I, ago. No, I know it's crazy. Time flies. Like, well, you having fun, it flies. That's the main thing, isn't it? But how was like your experience kind of, on this? Like, cause you, you, you've always yeah. been in this industry, haven't you? So you've always, but you yeah, seen this opportunity. Is that why you just went for it, or? Yeah, I think for I find the apprentice first of all really tough. Um, I know a lot of the people don't seem to have that experience on the show who win it, but for me, it was really, really hard. Um, I think because I wasn't really work, I wasn't working in business at all. So I was just working, I was working as a normal doctor. I was working in A&E in East London at the time, um, doing a bit of aesthetics on the side, but you know, full-time NHS doctor with no business experience, like zero. So I, when it came to like pitches, marketing, advertising, got everything related to business, I just had no idea. So yeah it was for me i find it really tough like all of the tasks i find them like hard like really hard so yeah for me but for me i also think i learned a lot because i was so clueless essentially going in i find the tasks like actually quite useful in learning about market i mean it's not a great time to learn if you're on <laughs> tv trying to win the show but it was a real steep learning curve for me um but yeah then obviously and the reason for doing it was well i i saw an opportunity in aesthetics um, but I didn't actually ever think I was going to win. So it was a bit of a shock, to be honest, um, that I did win. But I think it was great for aesthetics because it put Botox and filler, which um, was sort of the news headlines at the time, in, in the sort of public domain. It got people talking about the sector and the, the issues in the cosmetic sector in the UK because it is completely unregulated, um, remains completely unregulated. Um, but there was a lot more issues around that time around um, sort of quite shoddy practice, quite a lot of um, really, really poor outcomes, which I think have improved a lot and patient safety has improved a lot in the past decade in the cosmetic sector. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, part of it was to try and shine a light on some of the feelings of the industry that, I, you know, the cosmetic industry um, and awareness around that. And also to get the support of a business person like Alan Sugar, because I really didn't have the business 
you know, even if he had to just give me the money, I wouldn't have had the knowledge or the, you know, without his mentorship to actually build a successful business. So I really needed him. Um, and I also needed sort of awareness, really the publicity around the aesthetic space to try and um, do more patient education and, you know, make people more aware of, of the risks that are involved in, in having cosmetic procedures. Because at that time, it was it was just not something that was talked about in the same way that it is now. Yeah, yeah. I I, I would definitely want to touch base on that a bit later when we get into more of your clinics and that kind of side of things. But you are so right, though. It's, I, even from just the well-being and just skincare side of things, it's completely gone more knowledge than I did 10 years ago, right? And especially for the clinics and all that kind of stuff and Botox and filler, it's dang. Um, I know, it's crazy. I think patients now, I mean, my clients know... Uh, they're expert in their own right. I mean, they know so much now about um, skincare, about cosmetic treatments, but they're making such better choices. And I think that's that's really amazing. And I think also these treatments that we offer, um, so we offer Botox, dermal filler, thread lifts, etc. It's just cosmetic treatments in general. We do a lot of facial laser, a lot of acne treatments, scarring treatments, etc. People just having the confidence to discuss the fact that they're having these treatments is, is something that's changed enormously in the past decade and the stigma that was potentially around some of these treatments 10 years ago, it just doesn't exist anymore. And even the response in the media, I remember at the time when I won the show, there was like a huge backlash in the tabloid press around Alan Sugar backs Botox business. And it was like a real, you know, taboo thing for him to be involved in at the time. Whereas now like I live in Surrey in a small village or town maybe it is, but there's four, you know, Botox oh, yeah. clinics on the street. I mean, there's literally everywhere. So there's been, that just wasn't the case a decade ago. And I think what's happened with that um, is just a lot more discussion around these topics and making people feel more comfortable discussing, you know, the fact that they are having these treatments and they may benefit or need these treatments and a lot more of an open forum for, for discussion around them, which I think makes a safer environment for people to be making choices about their appearance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think online, I think, helps in that sense, like, to do a lot more research than, yeah. I, I don't know, like, have you ever, like, come across someone maybe before, you know, who's been having these treatments a long time and then you kind of, now they regret having these yeah i think there i think the good thing about the non-surgical sector so botox and filler is it is it's it's temporary so anything that we do in dr leah clinics max duration is two years and there's several really important reasons for that so it's not from a business perspective because we want the repeat clients although that does make it a good business but it is more related to the fact that trends change so a decade ago when we first launched, there was um, breast augmentation was very, very in vogue mm. at the time. Everyone was having very obvious implants above muscles. So you can see the sort of outline of the implant that was very, very fashionable. If we look now, the trends have moved entirely away from that in, in terms of um, breast augmentation. It's more now about the hips and bum. We went through a, a large boom in people having BBL. So to try and get that optimized hip and bum size. Um, but that may be something that again in you know three, four, five to ten years time may may not may no longer be fashionable. Yeah. So trends do change and I think that's important to always bear in mind with facial treatments. The thing that is irreversible is surgery. So when I see patients with an undesirable aesthetic permanent aesthetic outcome, it, it does tend to be from surgery. Um where either yeah you know things just haven't went as were planned often through no fault of the the surgeon or the patient it just hasn't been the outcome that anyone was hoping for um and that that's irreversible but the treatments that we offer i mean they're not always reversible so botox for example toxin um will last three four months there's not a lot i can do to reverse that in that time but i will only use reversible fillers um, and any body treatments, we do a treatment. It's like BBL, but it's it's not BB, it's not surgical, and it's not bomb filler. It's a stimulant. It's a product called Laluma. It's really really good. It's a collagen PLLA product. Goes on the is injected onto the muscle of the bum like a covering on the muscle of the bum, and then expands naturally your own natural collagen and elastin production. Um, so it gives a sort of nice, very natural augmentation of the buttock um area but again only lasts for two years you can have it redone in that time if that's still a desirable look for you but it won't cause any issues like removing implants on bum wood 
um, yep. where you can have laxity of the skin and, and it can be just a complex um, procedure surgically to remove. So yeah, I think in terms of things that I see in clinic it tends to be surgical outcomes that are irreversible. Ours tend to be um, maximum duration, two years. Because mm. I've seen, you know, like lip filler, a lot of people is now having yeah. that reverse. I've seen that a lot. Even personal yeah. friends of mine, it's like, it's just that last trend's gone. Like, um, what do you, th that's one thing that just keeps popping into my head is like the lip fear's definitely gone the <laughs> other now. Um, I don't know if that's kind of your preference because I know people might have certain preferences. I know you've given what a client wants, but then is it yeah. thinking, oh, actually, no, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. Because no, there, there is. And you can be really, um, I think, you can be really understanding of what the client wants to achieve, but I think you also have a professional responsibility, to, uh, you know, as an as, as an expert to to advise them on what is and what isn't going to be an, a desirable aesthetic for them. Um, I just try and use math. So there's a ratio called phi ratio, which is a ratio of beauty of the face. And when I'm doing an injectables consult, if it's for lip aug, so lip augmentation, for example, or cheek augmentation, just a beautification consult. I will map out their face in terms of the phi ratio. It's actually mathematical, and you can quite easily and objectively demonstrate if we go above this size on one feature, be it um, cheek, or sometimes people want a bit too much of a brow raise with, with threads or with Botox, or they want the lip size too big, or they want the chin. That really pointy chin went through a real popular phase, and everyone wanted this heart shape, but it was looking wide. <laughs> um, so it's really important that you show them objectively this is the ratio of your face that will give mathematically the best you know proportions for your face and we really shouldn't be going beyond that if we are going beyond that we're starting to look a little strange and it becomes obvious that you've had aesthetic work done as soon as anyone asks who your doctor is as soon as anyone ever asks my clients who I am they need to not see me again in my opinion because we've went too far you should never look at someone and feel like they've had aesthetic work done it really just needs to look like an attractive person and I think that's always been my mantra and my philosophy different clinics are different and they go for different ideals and I get that and to some degree there's an element of of se clients selecting the doctor that's right for them so you'll normally know from the before and afters and sometimes how the doctor present looks himself or what their sort of messaging is on their socials etc what sort of look um they they feel is desirable um but our clinics are very very much about a natural look so i'm delighted that everyone is reversing the lip filler <laughs> Um, yeah. because I never thought it, I, I'm just not a fan of lip filler in, in general. It needs to be so subtle. But the other thing I would say about people who are reversing lip filler, please believe me when I tell you, they are still having filler. So they will reverse lip filler and then they will redo with probably, the fillers have also improved in recent years, so over the past decade. So they'll right. redo with a filler that's less likely to migrate, less hydrophilic, so draws in a lot less water. You're not getting that sort of puffy lip look. A bit of a harder filler normally because we went too soft i think on the lip fillers and now we're moving back towards a more um hard filler so it doesn't look quite so you know swollen and just um and they're having less of it when they with a slightly better technique when it's redone so they're often not completely removing the lip filler they're normally changing the lip filler and going for a better product better injection style and um less filler in the refill um, and it looks better, you know, it looks natural and, and that's what these treatments should be about. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what it's kind of shifted to. I think a lot of people are wanting to go down the natural look route um, when they go in for clinics to get it done, you know. Um, oh, don't get me wrong, not everybody, because you still see these TV programs and then you see the more advanced people that just want everything done to look like a doll or something i don't know yeah, <laughs> like, it, 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 yeah. well i want to say though what is your kind of uh insight and like trends what what do you think of them like for example like if celebrity did a certain facial or something cosmetic and then everyone tries to jump onto it do you think well, well, well what, what what's your thoughts on on that yeah. so sometimes they're good things um so i remember the biggest one that we've seen in clinic is when kim k did the vampire facial do you remember yeah it? 
and it just went insane for PRP. Um, the one at the minute um, that's trending and has been for about the last 18 months is more face eight. Um, again, Kim Kardashian, she's so influential in the cosmetic space. She really, really is. Um, the cosmetic injectable space anyway. She had Morpheus 8 on her stomach and that just went crazy for Morpheus 8. I think Eva Mendes also did. Um, so the vampire face, sometimes they're really, they're good treatments. I mean, both of them are really good treatments. The thing that I always get a little bit worried about is when it's these things like, there was like a trend with skinny tea. This is a different thing with where every influencer oh. is promoting skinny tea and it's like, are any of you drunk this? Like, it, do you know what I mean? Like, so that those sorts of trends worry me more. The other thing, the D DIY do it yourself at home examples of different facial treatments, I get a little bit anxious around. I feel like, oh, just maybe let's just buy the product that does that where someone's done clinical tests for this or go into the clinic and have it done. Um, so sometimes they're good because they're promoting good treatments um, and other times they're, they're promoting things that really either don't work or maybe harmful. So it really depends what it is. Um, the one at the minute that is trending is um, the polynucleotide treatment around the eyes. So the fish sperm injections around the eyes. Um, so it's essentially, it's, they're actually really good. So we do it. It's, you take poly, it's called polynucleotide. It's essentially, um, it's taken from a sample or trout fish sperm and it's regenerative medicine so it's stem cell type dna essentially that you inject we use it a lot for eye area and it essentially reduces the fine lines wrinkles generates new sort of skin cells in that area it's really really good and um, because tear trough filler has been disastrous for our industry we've had so many issues with under eye filler that we needed a new alternative and this one polynucleotides for that under eye area and you can actually use an upper eye as well has, has proved really really good so that's what i think the future is going to be regenerative medicine so trying to stimulate our own body to regenerate our skin cells is what i believe the future of aesthetics is going to be so essentially prevention and age reversal if you like rather than using hyaluronic acid to sort of plump and fill um or surgery to sort of cut away the laxity yeah, yeah. That, I, I did not know about that one. So that, I'm going to look into that one. I think I think I might Poly use that one. When you have tides, come see me. Yeah, I do. I think I'm going to just try and get in with you. But someone did write in the comments, so what's your thoughts on skin boosters? Yeah, yeah. so it's a, this is a form of skin booster. So there's two main types. There are polynucleotides and there's hyaluronic acid skin boosters. Um, so hyaluronic acid skin boosters are things like Profilo, um, which is nice as a sort of moisturizer um, and Volite is another good one. I look at the HA skin boosters literally like an injectable moisturizer. So if you're someone who is, you've either got menopausally dry skin, which I see a lot of, or you just cannot put enough moisturizer on because it is just so drying because your estrogen um, levels are, are falling. It's just really hard to compensate for that with a topical moisturizer. Um, or if you're someone who just at this time of year, because it is really harsh, our conditions, we're in central heating, we're going out into cold weather, you're just feeling really dry, you're looking really dull, they're fabulous for that. So they're a quick boost is what I would say. Really good on neck as well if you're getting that sort of dry neck look. Um, but they, they will not essentially re regenerate the skin cells. So if you want to reduce the essentially the produce collagen elastin in a more dramatic way, you need to do polynucleotides instead. So the skin, skin boosters, yes, I'm all for them. I love them. They're natural. They don't give you a, a sort of, they don't sort of distort the anatomy of the face, but I would invest. It depends on what your need is, but I personally think you'll get more value from a polynucleotide skin booster than a hyaluronic acid skin booster. Ah, there we go. That's, that's that one. Yeah, because, yeah, it's, it's just, I, I, it's so many new things coming out all the time, and I think it's about the knowledge. So thank you for that, because you're the one who took all the knowledge. Because it's, sometimes it can be overwhelming, you know, when you're yeah. just so e online and it's, a lot going on you know because i'm really into the skincare side of things like i'm very deep into that but this is a completely different new thing for me, oh, yeah. me so about the clinic side of things you know which because yeah. i have tried like, like a lot of skin care from clinics and i love them um but i don't know if you get this as well because when i share and things like that online people will try it once or twice and think it's not working but 
I think we all know that a routine and being consistent and keep on doing it, that's when you see results, not instantly, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Skincare side of things. Because it, it, it's this big thing for you as well, like when you see your clients and you recommend is that you have to have a good skincare routine when you come see me and... I do. I find it really, um, I think there's so much education around skincare online, which is fabulous, that clients now more than ever really understand the fundamentals, which that was not the case, even as recent as pre-COVID, I don't think that was the case. Mm. So you we're talking to people and they were actually shocked that they should wear an SPF, UVA and UVB, protect your SPF every day. Whereas now my clients are telling me, I just want you to know, doctor, I am wearing Factor of SPF every single day. I'm like, yeah. great. They know that I'm going to ask that before I even ask that because the education is just there now. And I think a lot of that is social platforms. I think there's so much good skincare information available now online. I think there is less available regarding cosmetic treatments. Um, and I think that's where it is really worth coming in and seeing a cosmetic doctor who you, know, who you will build a rapport with and who you can trust and who you know sort of understands what you're trying to achieve. And if you're not planning any radical changes, you just want a maintenance plan, how can I age well? And a lot of my, a lot of my younger clients, so anyone sort of 35 and under, it's really just about looking at where they're at, planning where they're going. There's something at the minute, um, which is getting a lot of momentum. And it's something that I really think is a great idea where we're trying to bolster collagen levels in people who are in their 30s and 40s. So it's a collagen loading essentially to prepare them for longevity. So doing treatments like Morpheus 8, Ulthera, Ultherapy, to build up collagen elastin under the skin, even though they're not really collagen depleted per se at the minute, but it will just mean that down the line at their aging process, it's again about prevention rather than cure. They will never really fall on SAG in the same way that, you know, somebody who isn't doing collagen loading at the minute is will so we are that i think is going to become an even more of a trend certainly in my london clinics a lot of the people i'm seeing are already aware of the need to prevent um from really 30s you know that's that's the age you should be thinking about seeing a cosmetic doctor and just talking through what you're using skincare wise talking through what treatments are available for you because if people are reluctant to do it because they think it's going to be really extreme but it's literally will probably only be a consultation initially and then you can at least have the knowledge to take away. And even if it's no action for one, two, three, five, ten 10 years, you at least will be able to do things yourself to prevent. A lot of that is skincare. Um, but even just things like having regular microneedling. So that's just some derma, derma pen or derma roller, a bit of redness after, but particularly, you know, dramatic treatment. One session of derma pen or derma roller will build will build you up the same amount of college in the last that you lose every year from the age of 28 so just doing one of those a year will keep your college in the last in level at the age of 28 long term so that is something that's really easy to do really cost effective you're talking about up 200 pounds maximum um for that treatment and will just keep your college level up and also will give you just a really nice glow help pore size so these treatments don't have to be really radical or thousands and thousands of pounds. There's there's some, you know, really cost effective ways to to sustain your appearance as opposed in terms of an aging point of view, rather than to let things get to a point where it then when you're coming in and you're you're in you're, you're much further down the age in line and it's a lot harder to sort of bring things back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to touch on your, the collagen thing. Because I, I don't know if you do this, but I take a lot of like um, collagen drinks and things like that. Do you think, what's your thoughts on them? Cause, um... This is so interesting. So I get asked this so much. I don't think that they do any harm. Um, so we know that they're not harmful. I think it's really important we've got realistic expectations because the science around them is a little gray. Mm. Um, so they're not, but the science around Arnica, for example, for bruising is also you know, the, the clinical research in terms of how efficacious Arnica is to prevent bruising is also not 100%, but I still recommend you take Arnica if you're gonna have a thread lift because I, I anti, antidotally can see that it improves bruising. So I think that we have antidotal evidence. I don't think that they do any harm. Um, and I, actually, I, I just would have realistic expectations. So taking a collagen shot pill or drink every single day, is it necessarily gonna negate the need to do other collagen loading treatments? So. I think it's really important that people are realistic about what they can achieve, but I do think that they have a role in the anti-aging process. Yeah.
Yeah. So, but I know what you mean because they, they obviously they whack loads of vitamins in there and the collagen. I think I just don't know. Like I don't really dabble in it too much. I don't never share about it because I can't. I haven't really found something, and I don't want to share if I don't think it's doing anything. If that makes sense. So I always trial them. Yeah, I get asked quite a lot to do ambassador type work um, for them, and I haven't because I, I we also could do our own and haven't um, just because the science in the papers that I've read hasn't been yet, you know, all that conclusive is what I would say. So, but I think, you know, with every passing year, that whole industry, that sort of collagen supplementation industry has, has grown. Um, and I think that they're probably going to become more and more potent and there'll be more and more clinical trials and more and more research ongoing. It's a massive industry. Um, so, and we do know that they're not harmful. And I think that, you know, to date, there hasn't been any, you know, we're, we're aware they're safe, so they won't do you harm to take them, um, is what I think we have, we can establish from the clinical trials and the data that has been presented. It's just an efficacy question. So how much of an impact, how much of a difference will they make? Um, and I don't, I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. Right now. yeah. And it's, it's important, I think, to just have the right answers, you know, because it's you, you know, they're coming for you. And then if you're not 100% on it, I don't think it's, and I'm the same. I've tried so many from drinks to shots, to tablets. They even the one that fizzes, fizzes in the drink with water. Yeah. And I just haven't really, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite there yet. So I, I don't know. I think as an industry, it's a relatively new space, um, the collagen drinks, collagen supplement industry, and it is growing. And I think the evidence hopefully will get stronger um in the next few years but i think you know particularly as a doctor i only really can endorse things that there's very clear clinical trial evidence that we can present and say this is this is the tangible benefit that taking this will have for you um but equally i do think that there is antidotal evidence certainly our clients who take collagen drinks collagen supplements who who seem to feel that they look and feel better not only just from a cosmetic point of view, probably more so from just general well-being, joint pain type. I have one client thing in particular felt her joint pain had improved when she was on collagen supplementation. So there definitely um, is likely to be some antidotal evidence. I look at them the same as Arnica, like I said. So Arnica, I, I think, you know, I, it's herbal and I think it helps with bruising, but I, you know, can't say for sure how much it will help some people it does some people it doesn't but we know again with that it's not harmful so i would suggest if you're having a procedure you might as well take it yeah um and i feel the same about the collagen the collagen space i, I want to ask you though like because um i love that because you're very into you know research and keeping on top of everything what's going on in your industry right and then have you must have like obviously heard so many stories about people going abroad and having things mm -hmm. like what what's your kind of thoughts on that side because you hear so many I horror i know it's really hard because first of all i think there's a lot of judgment around oh my god you know you went abroad and had this done you know and there's a bit of like stigma around that but actually if we think about why people are doing that it's because of the prices in the uk for yeah. these procedures, like let's just be really candid about that. The cost of a surgical face and neck lift in the UK with a UK surgeon, you're probably talking, and I'm not sure I haven't had one, but I'm thinking 25,000 potentially. Um, if you are gonna go abroad to either, you know, Eastern European country or Turkey is the big one, obviously, that everyone's going to at the minute, then it's gonna be a fraction of that cost. And with that, there's an element of risk. If it was more reasonably priced in the UK, would those people choose to put themselves at higher risk and higher inconvenience by having to get a flight, stay in a hotel, etc., have someone to travel with them? The answer is no. So I think we as an industry need to, look at, as a UK industry, particularly the surgical, well, it is the surgical industry, mm. need to maybe have a look at why we have an outpouring of clients to Turkey for these procedures. It's a cost related matter. And is there something that we can be doing around patient education um, or making, you know, treatments more affordable in the UK? So I don't judge patients who, who do it. And I don't, you know, broadly condemn how could everyone have done that? I think we all we all have to be understanding. These are people who 
want to have these procedures and they became for them unaffordable in this country. Um, and that has that is something that has happened probably only in the last sort of again since COVID. I think the prices of cosmetic surgery went up a lot after COVID. Um, and you know, I think that's that's why we're seeing such an and you know such an exodus of people abroad. So no judgment on the patients, but solely for their safety, I would recommend they do see a UK surgeon for their procedures to be flying, you know. Not taking anything away from the surgeons performing this abroad, but the, the the UK is regulated by the GMC, General Medical Council. So our surgeons have a really strict, they're my regulator, they're every doctor and surgeon, a really strict regulatory process. The clinics are regulated by CQC, as are mine. I, you know, we've had multiple inspections by them. They are very they, they're governed very, very tightly. You know the standard of hygiene here, you know the standard of training that your doctor will have had here if they're a GMC registered surgeon, particularly if they're still working NHS at a consultant level. My, I honestly, I understand that people want the procedures. My advice is to, I know how much it costs here as well for surgery. My advice is to save up. Just, I know you, you might not want to do that, you want it now, but save up. Just take it, even if it takes another two years, three years, four years, and have it done in the UK. A, for the safety of the initial procedure, but B, for the follow-up. So if something goes wrong when you're back in the UK, which we've seen, how can you get back to Turkey? You can't fly if you've got a wound dehiscence. You know, you can't fly if you develop a deep tissue infection two, three weeks later. You've left Turkey and there's nothing really that you can, you know, how, 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 you, how are you gonna get fixed? This is what I'm worried about. And yeah. what then happens is that they become, they present at NHS hospitals because no private surgeons in the UK want to become involved, um, understandably for their own medical legal insurance. And the cost to have it corrected by a private surgeon in the UK will be more because the the cost of, of reversal treatments or retreatments will be higher normally than even the initial treatment. So they are at least the same. So it becomes you're really in a in a very bad place if it goes wrong. If it goes right, you've saved money. If it goes wrong, you're in a, a terrible situation. And the NHS will not do the reconstruction, so they will make good. And I think people need to understand this. So they will perform emergency and life-saving treatment only. They will not do the reconstruction. And that means that still has to be done by someone. So I feel like there is a lot of, there's a lot of um, lack of clarity on what happens when things go wrong if you've been treated abroad. So I understand completely why people are doing it, but I just would urge them even if it means you've got to delay this procedure two, three years, do, just, just save up and have it done in the UK. And then that surgeon is responsible. What, what if something goes wrong? That's your guy. You, yes. go, the, you, you drive there, you say you're responsible, you've done this treatment, I'm reporting you to your regulator and your governing body if you don't fix it, and they will yes. fix it. So that's my advice. Um, to, to anyone on surgery. And you know, there are cases of, of BBL is a big one. So BBL is a dangerous operation. Oh, it's, yeah. It was banned here for some time um, because it's literally, there is a risk of death. And you know, to be having that abroad to me is just, to be having that at all, I think is, is just too high a risk than, than anyone should be comfortable with, including the surgeon that's performing it because it's, it's so high risk for the patient, but also, to be having that abroad, I just feel like it's it's just you know, we we are there are well documented cases where people have literally died. So and there are safer non surgical alternatives. If you want a bigger bum and hips, have La Luma. La Luma will just expand and, and grow um in a much more natural way and it's dose dependent. So you can come and have two, three vials to begin with, wait three months. If you feel you want it bigger, do another three. It gives a better look and it's so much safer. Um so look at non-surgical alternatives or save up and have it done in the uk is my advice yeah i i've i would never go there just because i've heard so many i've seen so many bad stories so i just see always the bad side and i'll be like a saver you know it's like it's no rush that's, that's what i think is right. yeah take the time you know um because some people like obviously thinking about it for a while prior to having it done anyway, just was a little bit longer, you know, and having it done in your country. That's what I think. Yeah, um, I do.
But I want to ask her for um, what, what what would be like your best kind of skincare tip? Would you would you give? Well, what's your kind of little big tip? Mm. So one is my big tip. So I think that the most important. So the two key things I think in a skincare regime, the two they're not fancy products. The two most important things are your cleanser and your moisturizer. So if you get your cleanser and your moisturizer right, now I know people are using very, I mean, you, your skincare knowledge will be, will far surpass mine, um, but people are using very fancy serums, they're doing layering, um, they're using really a lot of actives now, everyone loves an active at the minute, but I honestly just think, just take it back to basics, you need to have good staple, staple products in your skincare regime, so that is a cleanser, a good foaming cleanser, so I love a foaming cleanser, and a good medical moisturizer. The other thing that I feel really, really strongly about is fragrance in skin products. Oh, yeah. It is so drying and so harsh on the skin. You need to be using fragrance free. And we as an industry are so slow. We've been so slow in moving to this. But I think more and more we are. Oh, I say that, but it's still incredibly slow. I, as you know, I formulated our products, which are a cleanser and moisturizer, because they're the two most important yes. products. And to have them fragrance free, I cannot tell you, Scott, how many attempts that took the reluctance from the chemists to do that was they were like this is crazy like we have to put it in fragrance and I, I, I can't because i don't like wearing it in my own skin i've got quite a dry skin so i actually don't tolerate fragrance that well i find it really dehydrating on my skin yeah but the amount of difficulty we had to produce a product that was fragrance free because they just don't do it because every single product has fragrance in so yeah i think avoid things with fragrance and have a really good stable stable um cleanser and moisturizer are my top yeah. tips do, do you know what, like with fragrance side of things my skin's quite sensitive my... so bad yeah <laughs> um and probably will break out to be quite honest and, 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 it, and it does like, i do stay clear away from them um you know doesn't matter how well it smells no no, no. I yeah, totally. But you will be so shocked the amount of products that are not even, you don't even smell it, but when you look on the, th well, some they would like knock you out as soon as you open them and there are just a no. But there's some, I won't know there's fragrance in until I put it on and I look at my face and I look bright red <coughs> because I'm sensitive. Yeah. Like you. Um, and I'm like, oh, wow, well, okay. And then when I read through the back, I'm like, oh, okay, fine. So, but it's not like a strong fragrance. It's normally just, they put in enough fragrance to sort of mask the, mask the smell of the natural ingredients but even if your skincare doesn't smell amazing it's i would prefer that than having just a dry especially moisturizers i really can't understand with moisturizers because the moisturizer is to moisturize and then you put in something in it that we know dehydrates the barrier so you try to nourish the barrier and you're also stripping it with a pulling the water out with a fragrance so it's it's the, the dichotomy of that is strange to me but so many moisturizers that's Say 95% of moisturizers that are available, at least 90% have fragrance in or trace fragrance, so at least something in that is dehydrating, which goes entirely against. So your moisturizer must be fragrance free, in my opinion, or you're essentially doing and undoing the same thing at the same time. And are you are you into personally yourself? Are you very into serums? No, as well. No, I prefer a cream because I'm so dry. Ah, okay. So I. And I also really struggle with retinol. So I know everyone loves retinol and cosmetic doctors in particular love retinol. But I, because I have a dry red type skin, I really struggle with retinol. And I have so many clients that also do, particularly at this time of year, because we are all so dehydrated. So a lot of the reason that I had to create our own line um, was because of the moisturizer that I was using, I have fragrance in. But also, I just needed something so moisturizing to counteract retinol so that I could, because we know the science behind retinol is really, really strong. Yeah. Um, we know that, and it really is undisputed. We know that it improves wrinkle depth. Um, so we, I'm really keen, obviously, as an anti-aging doctor to use retinol as part of my regime, but I just really struggled to get my skin to tolerate it. And I have to really, even now, and I've been using retinol for many years, I have to balance it with my own moisturizer really nourishing moisturizer so what i'll do one night of one one night of the other the other thing that people always do and i wouldn't do this because you're just wasting product when you are so for example tolerating retinol for me i can't use retinol every day i'm never going to reach that point some people just can't i'm too dry i'm too easily irritated so i started on one night a week and i built up now i do five nights on the other two nights which i'll scatter in between 
I will put only my moisturizer on. So I would just really layer on thick, definitely a moisturizer, really nourish, really hydrate the barrier. What I see a lot of people doing at the minute, which is counterproductive, is putting retinol on and then putting their moisturizer over the top. But you're essentially, again, doing one thing and then on diluting it with the moisturizer. You don't need to do that. You're better to use the retinol one night and use the moisturizer than the, the night after. And then you're not using double the product because a lot of these products are quite expensive. You know, if you're buying a medical moisturizer, medical retinol, et cetera, it's quite, you need to use, people aren't keen to be using loads and loads of the product. You need to be cost effective as well in your regime. Um, so I, I don't lay on top of retinol. If I'm wearing a retinol, if I'm, if I'm doing my retinol day, I do my retinol and I sleep with the retinol. I don't layer a moisturizer on top. I do the next night break retinol, no retinol. And I do my moisturizer that night. And that way I'm getting the same net result, but I'm not using double the product. They, oh, that's a really good tip. I think a lot of people I don't think know that. Yeah, because it is quite dry in retinol. Very. But you've got to just, you just got to just do it the minute you go to bed, really. <laughs> like, you know, but then just sleep through it. because, And then the next day, a lot of people don't know that's a really good one. Because obviously in our, I think education wise, it's just like cleanser, toner if you need to i don't bother with the toner personally um you know serum moisturize you know mm -hmm. do, do, do. But a lot of people will not will not know to cut out the moisturizer if you do a retinol night yeah just sleep in the retinol you're just diluting the retinol by putting the moisturizer on which is fine if you want to do that but you can get the same result the dilution effect over the week by just skipping two nights of the retinol and doing the moisturizer on those mm. nights mm. Okay, I got some like fire kind of questions for you now because uh, I don't want to keep you too long. No but Linux, we got. I know you got one in Essex, one in London right now. Two in London, oh. two in London, one oh. in Essex. Sorry, yeah, two in London, one. And then, uh, what's your plans? Are you going to go out more? Yeah. Are you going to go? Uh, I think we will. I think we will. I've just had a do I had a child about a year a year ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I have halted our expansion <laughs> while I expand my own family. Um, but I, she's up a little bit now, so I think we'll do another clinic probably in the next year. Um, but outside um, of that sort of London area, probably home counties, and then maybe we'll go further afield than that. Um, I just think the industry has grown so much. It's, it's, there's so much opportunity there for, you know, a, you know, a brand that people, you know, can relate to, can trust, and the clinics are doing great. So. Yeah, I think ideally I, I wouldn't want many above five clinics because I think I don't really want, I, I want to keep it quite, I want to still be able to be in all of them. Yeah. I still want to have that sort of personal experience with me being able to be there. And I think above five, I don't think I could physically be there um, in all of them. But yeah, so I, I plan to do another two. Okay, exciting. All around that similar area, but just obviously expanded out. Yeah, I might go slightly more north with one because we have a lot of people that are traveling um, at the minute, which yeah. people are happy to do for bigger treatments. So La Luma, the bum enhancement or the um, thread lift they will travel for. But in terms of your regular treatments, you probably want somewhere local. It's quite a lot. If you're coming from, say, Manchester or Leeds to come the whole way to London for your toxin every sort of three, four months. So I think I may do one um, up north. Okay, yeah. And then back to the apprentice side of things. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's, it's just mm -hmm. recently now, the new piece. So we can't give them any advice. But if someone was going to go on, and what advice would you give? So I think just find some, I actually think do the numbers. That's my advice. So that's what I did. So I obviously didn't know that much about business, but my mental arithmetic was pretty good. It's pretty good. And you don't get a calculator. Um, so if you do, if you can do math and you're quite good at math, then you should just do the numbers in every task, because if you get the numbers right, you'll actually probably, it's not the most glamorous rule, it's probably the least glamorous rule, but if you just get that right, if you can do math, okay, and you do, it's not hard, hard math, it's just like basically calculating margin measurements, things like that, you can basically get no one fires a numbers person if you get it right you're you'll a win the task but if you get it right and you don't win the task you're not going to lose it because they calculated the you know if you've got the numbers right you're pretty safe so find something that you can do 
even if you're not, I mean, obviously I didn't do a lot of pitching because I'd never pitched before in my life, anything. Didn't do a lot of advertising or marketing because again, I had never done advertising or marketing in my life. Didn't do any brands and never done that. So I just did num I just did a lot of the numbers. Um, and then I had to be project manager. You have to do a bit more as the task goes on, but then you've got a few, you know, five, six, seven, eight tasks under your belt. So you sort of know how to do a bit more of the other things. So yeah, do the numbers. That's my top tip. That, got, that might be the way of winning. You never know. We'll get into the end. Like, who knows? <laughs> no one wants to do the numbers, honestly. It's, everyone's like, no, no, not me, not me. I want to do the pitch. Everyone wants the glamorous stuff. No, <laughs> the key is do the numbers, do the boring stuff. And actually in business, there's a really important lesson there. Because in business, yeah. that is important. It's the, like background stuff, the sort of, you know, the work behind the scenes, not necessarily the sort of big pitch, the, the, the glory bit that, that makes that makes something really? successful. Do, do, do you still watch it? Are you yeah. still a big fan? Yeah, yeah. I actually love the show. So I normally watch it and catch up because I work late on Thursday, on Thursdays. Um, but yeah, I actually am a really big fan of the show. And obviously, Alan Sugar is still my business partner. I know him very well. Yeah, worked yeah. for basically 10 years. Um, and it really is a great opportunity for someone I honestly he's great and I think if you you get so much more out of it than just the prize money you really do so obviously that's helpful for a business but actually in terms of him and what he can offer you in terms of support guidance reassurance at times you know especially for some younger entrepreneurs just having someone believe in you and like that in its own self is, is really, really helpful for your confidence. It was something I certainly feel I needed and benefited from. Um, and just having a sounding board for your business and for your sort of journey in him, um, I find really, really helpful. So I think it's an amazing opportunity for someone. I, I know you've been working with him for like 10 years now, but like, does he still kind of scare you now? Or like, not scare you, but you know, thinking, oh, oh gosh, you, you feel a bit nervous. You know, yeah. Yeah, I think he has that presence. Is that yeah, naturally. I think. He naturally does, honestly. I think he just is he has an aura and a presence. Obviously, yeah, he, he does. He has that. And I still call him Lord Sugar, so I never call him Alan. Okay. Um I don't know if you'd mind if I did call him Alan, but it's a bit like your school teacher in, in school. I yeah. still if I see school teacher, I still call him Sir and it's like they're they probably retired ten years ago, but yeah. um it's yeah, I think he just has that presence, but you know, he's he's been fantastic for me and I've actually really, really enjoyed working with him over the past decade. He's not like, how he is on screen is how he is. So there, that's not a pretense or it's not in any way scripted. He is just, that is his demeanor. That is his personality. He's the same now as, as when I met him in a boardroom on film The Apprentice. Yeah. Um, so he's very matter of fact, he's extremely direct. He will say it how he sees it and there, <laughs> there is definitely in the early few years sometimes where you need to just, especially coming from medicine, I think that is something about the business world that is a bit different than my career as a doctor. Mm -hmm. So I was working NHS and I actually went back and worked NHS. Even after I won, I <clears throat> worked, went back and worked NHS for another three, four years, even alongside the clinics, because for me it was important. I wanted to do it and I actually just enjoyed clinical practice yeah. as well. But the dynamic of being in a sort of MDT, multidisciplinary NHS team of doctors, nurses is very, very different to the world of business. And I think that that, that transition for me was something that I find quite hard. Whereas I think for some of the other winners of The Apprentice, because they were already working in very corporate environments, which can be quite like fiery, like, you know, direct. Yeah. Like, that that wasn't something that they maybe find as hard but for me i was literally like sitting in meetings like whoa 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 <laughs> like this is whoa that, like that would just not ever happen in the nhs so or in any medical environment so it's yeah i i think i think there was definitely times in the early years i was like whoa but yeah i think that was just part of my my sort of immersion into business really which has been i felt i mean i've said that before i felt like i was being you know business is like a den of lions and you're just sort of thrown in when you win a show like The Apprentice yeah. and you know you're dealing with people that have very very strong personalities um and yeah the world of business is is tough yeah yeah, yeah. it is it is but you, you you're living proof like hard work and you know and you, you're doing it you know what I mean you got three clinics going more on the way 
potentially. So no. You don't know, you don't know. But like, how about, how about Lord Sugar? Do you think he's, has he come to your clinic? Has he had any treatments or, or is he just silent? So I have offered, of course. Yeah. Um, like, I'm more than happy to time. Wouldn't you? I would love, love to treat him. I tell him this every time I see him, come see me, come see me. No, he's not, he's really not someone who, who cares about um, appearance. He's, he's just someone who you know he every time i see him i tell him you need to see me more and more every birthday i tell him i'm literally booking you in but he is just he's not interested so maybe one day we'll see yeah yeah yeah, yeah. there's no rush but like just because naturally you would ask because he's part of the clinic in a way as well you know so like, yeah I come in but uh no he still doesn't want to but He's declined, declined my kind offer of smoothing his his face. <laughs> well, that, that was just a little bit, yeah, a little bit of a smooth out. That's all. No, I think. No, 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 can't persuade him, not yet, anyway. And it's been 10 years of trying. Try him. Keep try trying, honey. You're, you're going to break through sooner or later. Uh, but one final question before you go, um, because you just, like I see, you are a mother now, mm. very successful businesswoman. Like, what is your advice um, for a mother with a business? You know, how do you even manage life in general? Because you're very busy and yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of coffee okay. um, is really helpful. Yeah. Um, but no, I, uh, Lila is wonderful. And I had my daughter, I was 34 when I had her. Um, and I felt really ready from a career point of view as much as other aspects of my life, just because I felt the businesses were already, the clinics were already sort of nine, nine years old, quite established. So I think for me, the timing was perfect because I had they'd sort of already been built up um, and I was able to take the step back. Alan Sugar put his right hand man in, in the clinics to run them while I was on maternity leave, which was really helpful. And I've got a really good manager, general manager as well, who helped. And I built the team. It's a, it's a decade old team at that point. Um, so that bit was fine. And I really love both. I think I do a four day week now. So I do four days at work in and I do three at home with Lila, my daughter. And I really think that's a lovely balance for me. And I just think it's such a privilege to be a mom. And it's also such a privilege to be able to work and do something that you genuinely love. And I think the one, the one time with one makes you appreciate the other so much. And it's, I don't know, I just, I actually feel I appreciate how lucky I am to have the businesses and to love what I do so much more so since I've had my daughter. Um, so for me, it's actually made me probably a bit more motivated because now you're also working for her. You're, you're trying to, um, you know, show her a good example. She gets a wee bit older and, and show her you know what and build build success you know and legacy for her as well yeah D did you have your full maternity because no it never yeah yeah a lot of moms that own businesses yeah don't but yeah i did i had four and a half five months off um and then i did a phase return so i didn't go back to a four-day week until she was a year um but yeah i think it was fine i traveled a lot when she was really small which was really lovely, um, like really small. So I went, saw my family in Ireland, obviously I'm Irish. The, I went and saw my partner's family, they're South African. Um, we spent a lot of time in Dubai. So yeah, I really, really, really loved my maternity leave. Um, it was amazing, but then my partner took time off up until she was a year. So that meant I was able to go back at five months, which was, which was really helpful. Yeah nice 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 i love it she's so cute as well i've seen her and see yeah she's adorable black. she's so lovely she really has been a great baby as well so we got very lucky yes yeah she's a cutie but Dalit, thank you so much for coming on um lovely speaking to you and yeah but i have so many more questions but i'll have to just message you on my thing because i want to know much more do but I have come to see me yeah one day i have to come and see yeah. you thank you so much i've loved it you're welcome take care Okay, lovely. Bye-bye.